Hi folks, hope you're okay today. I want to just talk about the Gnostic Gospels and Islam. Here's the Quran. And I just want to talk about the critique that Muslim apologists make towards uh, Christianity. And uh, one of the things that they say is they say, well, early Christianity, there was multiple different Christianities, so we don't know which is the true Christianity, and there were Christianities that didn't believe that Jesus died and rose again, and they affirmed the Quran, and so therefore they must be the right right view of what Christianity is, and this idea that Jesus rose again, well that's heterodox, it's not orthodox, and it came late, it was not early Christianity, true Christianity didn't believe in the cross of the resurrection, etc. So, I want to talk about, and so what they try to do is then they look at the Gnostic Gospels and they'll say, look, there are all these Gnostic Gospels and here's the proof, there were all these different ideas of Christianity, what we're saying is true. Now, in this book, uh, The Heresy of Orthodoxy by uh, Michael J. Kruger, um, published by Opolis, it's a very uh, academic book, he says, uh, that there was an early orthodoxy there wasn't many Christianities there was an early orthodoxy first of all on page 75 he says at another critical juncture in the ministry of Jesus appointed his 12 apostles Matthew chapter 10 verse 1 and 4 Matthew cha Mark chapter 3 verse 13 and 15 Mark chapter 6 verse 7 and 13 Luke chapter 6 verse 13 Luke chapter 9 verse 1 and 2 so right early on in the church, there were these leaders that were appointed. So it's, it's nonsense to say there were many Christianities. There was one Christianity because the Lord appointed leaders. And these leaders taught what the Christian faith it was to be. Then Kruger says, the continuity between Jesus and his apostles and their grounding in Old Testament messianic prophecy is further extended through Paul and his gospel preaching. Writing in AD 50, he says, now we would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according with the scripture, and that he appeared to Cephas and to the twelve. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 and 4. Paul's message of good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, the gospel, did not originate with him, but was a message he had received and mainly passed on to others as of first importance. So, it, there couldn't have been many Christianities, because Paul is saying it was passed on to him. Uh, then we have liturgical material that precedes the New Testament, that shows you there was one Orthodox Christianity. Uh, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 11, Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 20 represent early Christian hymns what Paul incorporated into his letters from various for various purposes regarding the Christian hymn of uh, Philippians 2 6 and 11 arguments for its pre Pauline origin include number one its unusual vocabulary number two its rhythmic style number three the absence of key Pauline themes such as redemption and resurrection etc Excuse me. Uh, Kruger goes, in any case, whether Paul, Pauline or pre-Pauline, what is remarkable is that these passages are characterised of a very high Christology. Jesus equated with God in Philippians 2, 6, Colossians 1, 15, 19, and presented as the exalted Lord in Philippians 2, 11, uh, 2 9 and 11, Colossians 1, 15, 18. These portions also re-emphasize the importance of the cross as a core component of the gospel, Philippians 2.8, Colossians 1.20. That Paul might have been able to draw on these types of materials in his correspondence with the churches under his jurisdiction could have kept, could, at, would attest to the early nature of Christian worship of Jesus as God and exalted Lord. And you can read uh, page 76 of this book as well. So that's Michael Kruger, The Heresy of Orthodoxy, and uh, his other friend, and it's by Apollos, and it's a very helpful scholarly work. 
Um, so what this book proves and shows is that there was an early Christianity, and he proves that from the New Testament. Leaders were chosen, there were hymns right early on that were sung, and creeds that were stated that had a very clear definition of what Christianity was. So there wasn't many, many uh, Christianities. But now let's get back to the Gnostic Gospels. I've been reading the Nag Hammadi uh, collection. The Nag Hammadi collection, which is a number of Gnostic Gospels. Um, and I'm just going to give you my thoughts about these. We have uh, the, uh, the... These are some of the ones that I've read. The Apocalypse of Adam. Uh, the Hypostasis of the Archons. The uh, Acropon of John. What I noticed in the Hypostasis of Archons, it's quoting... Uh, from Ephesians 6, Paul's Pauline epistle. So what that tells me is the Gnostic writers, one of the Gnostic writers, and, and I presume some others there, regarded Pauline epistles as authoritative as the word of God. So obviously the Gnostic Gospels come after uh, Paul's epistles. Uh, the Apocalypse of Adam mentions eons. The, uh, the apocryphon, the apocryphon of John um, quotes the book of Revelation and mentions eons. And has very similar language to the Council of Nicaea. What does that tell me? What it tells me is that there was very mystical speculation that was nothing to do with Christianity that's the word eons secondly there seems to be a borrowing and an admittance of the New Testament as authoritative because it quotes the book of Revelation and it's using uh, orthodox language as well that's what I get from that Gnostic Gospel In the treatise on the resurrection, it mentions Jesus is crucified, it mentions eons, it mentions Father, Son and Holy Spirit. What does that tell me? It tells me that this is a, a text that comes across to me as a text that is moving away from an orthodox position that, that it had some core of the orthodox position but that it got this language of eons and it had this orthodoxy of Father, Son and Holy Spirit but it was mixing it with this kind of mystical theology um, it uses the word Son of God in the treatise of the resurrection and it sees Paul as authority the gospel of truth also says that Jesus was nailed on the cross. So this debunks Islamic scholarship and attack on the Christian faith because they're saying there are many Christian Christianities. Uh, but the Gnostic Gospels, some of them are actually quoting because the, the, the Muslim apologists will say that there were these groups that didn't believe in the death of Christ. But even the uh, heterodox, even these unorthodox Positions actually, some of them were saying that Jesus was crucified. Uh, what we're seeing here, as we look at these texts, is a is a reference into the New Testament. So these Gnostic writings see the New Testament as authoritative. So obviously, these Gnostic writings are coming after the time of Jesus, uh, the time of the apostles, the time of the New Testament. The Gospel of Thomas is definitely later than the New Testament. Um, in verse 4 of this Gospel, um, it, 
it refers to uh, one of the Gospels. It, it, it's a passage where we need to be like a little child and it quotes the Gospels uh, but misinterprets it. In verse 7, uh, it says, Lions become human, human becomes lions. This is obviously a Gnostic kind of philosophy. In verse 9, it talks about the sower, which is a reference to the Gospels. Uh, verse 32, it reference to Matthew, city on a hill. Um, verse 57, God's seed. Um, verse 69, the Beatitudes in Matthew. Verse 102 condemns the Pharisees, like Luke. And verse 109, treasures in the field. So the Gospel of Thomas is quite clearly from a scholarly opinion, because I've read it. It's quite clearly referencing the gospel. So the gospel of Thomas came after the gospels came after the New Testament. Um, I read uh, the Thunder Perfect Mind Codex Six. I read there was a, a fragment called Plato Republic Five Eight Eight. 589. What, what that Plato Republic fragment in the Nag Amani shows is that they were influenced by philosophy and I think they were influenced by Neoplatonism. They weren't Christian at all. Um, I read the second treatise of the Ernest of Seth, uh, the Asclepius 21-29. Um, concept of the great power, the authority of teaching, these are all Gnostic Gospels, the teaching of Slavinus seems to be a stoic philosophical pamphlet, uh, the Eugenatis the Blessed, a philosophical treatise on Sophia, uh, very self-assured philosophical treatise, um, Discourse on the 8th and 9th seems very Middle Eastern and Indian. The prayer of thanksgiving. Um, the prayer of the apostle relies on John and Paul. Um, the apocalypse of Peter attacks bishops. Uh, the Acts of the Peter and the Twelve Apostles. Sounds like the Quran. Um, second, the cop uh, apocalypse of James, the tradition of the death of James, etc. Uh, the Sophia of Jesus Christ says he uh, rose from the dead. Um, so, so I only read two thirds of the uh, Nag um, Amani. Um, gospel gnostic gospels so my opinion what's my opinion of these uh, writings so far number one these writings reference the new testament okay so they see the new testament as our authoritative number two these writings uh, could be classed into like three categories or maybe four categories the first category is uh, a kind of um, respect to orthodoxy so there is uh, some of the writings seem to be quite orthodox but then they just put in a little bit of Gnosticism like the word eon in alright the second group are philosophical treaties so there are a couple of them that are very self-assured philosophical treaties that has nothing to do with Christianity a third group are very mystical kind of Middle East uh, a kind of Eastern kind of esoteric writings where um, there are these mystical experiences that they describe. A fourth type is uh, ethical statements really that they've borrowed from uh, the New Testament. And I suppose that's generally uh, some of the categories really. But the key point in all this is there's actually Number one, if the Muslims say there are many Christianities, you could say, well, actually, there was one, and the Gnostic Gospels prove it, 
because A, sometimes they try to mimic it, B, they're often caught in the New Testament, and C, the Gnostic Gospels were not really Christian. They were either philosophical or kind of Eastern uh, mystics. And you, you've got to be clear in your definition and defining of these Gnostic Gospels. They were not just all the same. And they weren't Christian. In, they, they definitely weren't Christian. Um, they, they, they kind of took on Christianity uh, at the beginning, but then they played around with it. And then they veered off into mysticism and philosophy and then tried to take over by saying that the bishops and the churches were wrong. That's what my impression so far, what I'm getting from the Gnostics. Uh, I hope that's a help. Uh, that's my scholarly analysis of reading quite a lot of these uh, Gnostic Gospels. But they are n they're in, they, in, they directly, indirectly confirm the Orthodox position because they're using sometimes, on very few occasions, but they're using uh, Trinitarian language sometimes. Sometimes they're referencing the Orthodox position of the death and resurrection of Christ. So they're confirming that that was early in the early church. They reference the New Testament often, confirming that the New Testament came before them and the New Testament was authoritative. And at the same time, they condemn themselves as not being Christian because they either move into this very Neoplatonism, mystical, uh, Eastern kind of writing, or into a very stoic, kind of philosophy which isn't Christianity at all that's my analysis and I hope that's a help for you God bless you thank you for listening and take care bye now